Last year, more than 100 elderly people went to Mexico to buy a lethal drug, which they then smuggled back into Australia. If I had been caught and put into prison, I felt I still was justified in doing what I had done, getting the name of because I think it's my right. Hey guys, how are you? Most of these elderly lawbreakers don't have a terminal or chronic illness. They plan to take the drug when they're tired of life, when they can no longer look after themselves. I just want it in the cupboard so that when the time comes, I can reach for it. Remember, everything is hot. Some elderly people too frail to make the trip to Mexico have turned to other drastic means. They've been making the lethal drug Nembutel in backyard laboratories. If you believe in something, you should be prepared to stand up and face the consequences. A lot of people would say, look, if you're working in a backyard laboratory to produce an illicit substance, you all deserve to go to jail. Well, if, we, if so, so be it. I'll serve my time. Toil, boil, toil and trouble. <laughs> it's outrageous that we've been forced into this position because we can't legally obtain a drug that will give us a peaceful death when we want one. It's not illegal to end your life. Why is it illegal to have the drug that will do it? Should there be a pill available to elderly people so they can suicide? No, there shouldn't be. Yeah, there shouldn't be, simply because that's actually society basically saying that they have no value. Tonight, Four Corners talks to a vocal minority of elderly who plan to suicide when faced with going into nursing homes. Some are taking their complaints to Parliament, while others are going much further. They're committing civil disobedience and breaking laws in what appears to be the next movement to grow out of the euthanasia debate. Four Corners investigates the extreme measures these senior citizens are taking. Hello, how are you? Muriel Arnott has dedicated much of her life to helping the elderly. Until recently, she chaired the board of this upmarket aged care facility in Melbourne. A physiotherapist, she's worked with the elderly and been a team leader of Meals on Wheels for 30 years. My memory is that you were 85, so it's got to be about three years ago. Today, Muriel Arnott is visiting her 88-year-old mother, who was recently admitted into this home after she could no longer care for herself. Mm. You know that I filled in all those papers for you? Yes. yes. Muriel Arnott spent yeah. years helping to get this aged care facility off the ground, but it's not what she wants for herself. I don't want to come here in my old age because I want another choice for my life. I'm certainly thrilled that people who want to come here can have this level of care and in this pleasant environment and the dignity that everything, the environment and the care that they get uh, provides for them, but it's not for me. You're so docile compared to what you used to be. The Melbourne you know, widow is one problem. of a number of ageing Australians planning to suicide when they can no longer look after themselves. I accept the journey of life and I accept that that journey has an end. I don't accept the, the, the fact that that journey is extended unnaturally uh, and I hope that my family will have the respect for me and also understand that I want to have a finalisation of my life at a point at which I still have dignity. Hi Mum. Hello. We're here. Hello. Hello darling, how are you? <laughs> Muriel Arnott is very close to her sons and their families. Daddy. That's Daddy. I love my mother enormously and she has a huge involvement in our day-to-day -day lives from uh, assisting us with the care of our, our daughter through to uh, just being there as part of a, a, a close-knit family. All right, do you want to go and have a cup of tea? Oh. Who would like a cup of tea? Yeah, that'd be lovely, thank you. Mm. 
Chris Arnott respects his mother's right to one day take her own life. I think she's seen the consequences of not having that choice, particularly through her professional career, and she would like to have that choice to end her life at a, at a time of her choosing. Will we make a cup of tea? We pour a little bit of milk? Did you ever try and talk her out of it? Never. Two. Oh, do you think that's all right? At 66, Muriel Arnett is a long way off wanting to die. I don't want to pinpoint an age, a day, a year or anything. I just want to know that when I feel that this is the right time for me, then I know what my options are. Do you know how your mother plans to end her life? No, I don't. Do you want to know? Uh... I'm sure that as the, the time gets closer, we, there may well be a topic of discussion. Would you like to be there? If possible. It's not a crime in Australia to suicide, but it is a crime to assist someone else. For that reason, many families are cautious about being present at the suicide for fear of being implicated in the death. Muriel Arnott is well aware of the dangers. I have to make the choice because society, the laws, do not allow that to anybody to assist me at that point. So I have to be physically and mentally capable. Any drug that you take to end life, taken by mouth, the general recommendation is that an anti-vomiting drug be taken. We've got Muriel Arnott will be prepared when the time comes, although she's reluctant to talk about what method she intends to employ. So that she's organised, she, along with thousands of other ageing Australians, have been going to end-of-life workshops run by controversial euthanasia advocate Philip Nitschke. Those attending all have one thing in common. If you would be a person who would be even thinking along the lines of taking your own life when you can no longer look after yourself or when you're forced to go into a nursing home. Anyone here of that position? It's pretty clear it's overwhelming. I think that the group who attend the workshops are vitally active, engaged, engaging, um, interesting people and who have the capacity to seek out an opportunity to provide them with choices. We actually put all of the information that was in the workshop series last year into this book and the book was published. It's not a movement the Right to Life Association likes. Earlier this year, its complaints led to the banning of a book by Philip Nitschke which had details of suicide methods. I think these people who come to Nitschke uh, may have for uh, the wrong, potentially the wrong reasons, um, find themselves in no other circumstances but to consider suicide. Uh, my concern is basically that Nitschke doesn't even help them to explore other positive ways of addressing their issues. Have you ever talked anyone out of suicide? Oh, many times, many times. This idea that we've got this huge pool of very vulnerable, fragile people out there is to do a grave disservice to, I think, and to paternalise, patronise, uh, the uh, integrity and the ability of our elderly folk who know exactly what they're doing. Now, we don't advocate hanging. That is a grim, horrible death. But we the Australian the Medical Association has concerns about the movement too. There's a high level of interest in ending of life because there's such a big push and insight into the fact that life in a later age perhaps has no value or is a burden or is undignified or costs money to the health system. With all those negative messages, with people who have a high level of education in particular who process those messages and, and look at them and say, goodness, the best solution is to end my life. I'm not surprised people are attending the workshops. So let's have a break. It's like Muriel Arnott, many of those people at the workshops have a medical background. Now, you've both been nurses, yet you want the right to end your own life rather than go into a nursing home or leave your own family home. Why? Well, it's important to me. I just don't want to end up as a vegetable uh, after having a stroke or anything ghastly like that. I know people who have, and of course I've seen hundreds of them. 
and I live on for years. Well, if I won't have the quality of life, then it's no use to live. So how would you do it? Any idea? Well, I'm already prepared, and I have the next best to Nambutal. What's but, that? Oh, I don't even know the name. It's in my filing cabinet, mm -hmm. hidden away. Why not grow old? Why not? I'm old now. <laughs> <laughs> It's censorship, really, isn't it? Yeah. Censorship. That's right. And, um, we're not supposed to be a censorial society, but we sure are as far as uh, suicide's concerned or ending your own life. Retired surgeon and GP Richard Opie has been to two suicide workshops in Sydney. It's had practically no publicity. I'm all in favour of people who want to terminate their lives at a suitable time, and I think anybody over 90 is, must have a suitable time. Um, why should they be prevented from doing it? It's just ridiculous. Richard Opie, a World War II veteran, has no immediate plans to take his life. At 90, he's too active for that. He swims every day, plays golf twice a week, goes to the gym, plays bridge and belongs to a book club. Just being alive and looking at the birds and the bees and the trees, it's, it's, it's a source of great pleasure. Anybody who doesn't enjoy being alive, I feel sorry for them. Is Richard afraid of growing old? No, he's old. Richard's old. He's not afraid of growing old. No, he's afraid of being disabled, mainly, I think. The reason why anybody who's not depressed wants to terminate his own life is the fact that the very fact of living becomes so uncomfortable that you don't want to keep on doing it. How many years have you got left? Well, um, I would think two. Julia thinks you'll live till, till you're 100. Oh, well, Julia was an op she's an optimist. Why only two? Well, I find, um, <coughs> I find I'm getting increasingly incapacitated, um, particularly compared with when, for instance, when I was 80. The last 10 years make a big difference and the last two years has made quite a difference too. Some experts believe most elderly people like Richard Opie will not suicide, as they'll lose the capacity before they have a chance to act. I'm still unconvinced that it's possible to determine the moment in that long fatal illness, which is life, uh, when you should take your life if you're fit and healthy. I just think that's uh, too hard. Do you think that is a possibility with you, that you could lose capacity? Yes, I think that's a real possibility. For that, for that reason, I would be prepared to advance it a little bit if I had to. I've got every faith in him. I think that he's not going to do it lightly and he's not going to do it uh, just because something's too difficult. He does... Uh, gets through life every day with uh, chronic pain and, and arthritic problems. So when he does do it, it'll be his decision and he will know when the time has come. He just does not want to be disabled. Is he depressed? No. He's the original party boy. <laughs> no, Richard's a very social being. He's not, not depressed, not at all. <laughs> 1,100 elderly Australians, mostly men, suicided in the five years to 2005. They often took their lives using violent methods, mostly by hanging or shooting themselves. Richard Opie plans to die peacefully. I would find it traumatic if he, if he chose a violent path. And have you thought about how you would do that? Oh, yes, I've got it worked out, yeah. How? Well, I'd rather not discuss that because uh, it might give a few other people ideas and we might have the thought police around here searching the house or doing something stupid like that. Ed Brown's been fighting prostate cancer for years, 
but he says he can't fight old age. He's 83. While ever you've got some enjoyment in life, people will cling to life and, and hang on to it. It's when the quality of life is gone, when the essential things you can only do for yourself until you become an invalid, well, well, uh, you, you, you stick to life. The others just do what you can do. Well done, Tom, look at him, he's up. Ed Brown is not religious and has no qualms with taking his own life if faced with going into a nursing home. OK, one at a time. So, his yeah. wife, Coral, has similar plans. Once my quality of life has gone to the stage when I can't live my life as I want, I won't want to hang around. When do you plan to do this? Well, I don't know. It might be next year, it might be five years. I've got no idea. The Northern Territory Euthanasia Legislation it's 10 years since Ed and his son Richard are very close, but they don't see eye to eye on this issue. So, so you went to Canberra for the euthanasia conference? Yes, it was a day of shame, they call it. It was two busloads of people went to Canberra. The most common form of suicide amongst old people is hanging themselves. What a dreadful thing for you, for your um, loved ones to come and find you hanging. I just, uh, I couldn't do that. But I will find a way. If we get a feeling of compulsion about it, I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. I mean, he, his life is his responsibility. You know, I love him very, very much. It's a subject that is, is, is very emotional for me. It's one that I would, would struggle with to talk to him. You know, I'd, I'd be struggling with not, you know, um, coming into tears with it. Nanny and I go to the pinball players. They, uh, Richard, a practising Christian, believes through suffering people grow just as Jesus Christ did. It is part of life. It's an unpleasant part, but I think most psychiatrists, psychologists would agree that the major growth we have personally is through suffering. Christianity isn't about, you know, being comfortable and doing what pleases you. You know, it's, it's about realising that our life and this earth is a gift and we have a responsibility to, to live in it responsibly. It's not my belief. I don't believe suffering does anybody any good and, and uh, people should be able to end it one way or the other. Richard says that life's a gift and it's not an ind up to an individual to decide when it ends. Yeah, well, that's a religious belief. Most religions believe that. I'm not religious. Uh, if they believe that, good luck to them. But uh, I believe that uh, uh, life ends when uh, all quality's gone out of it. That's the time. A constant question regarding old people wanting to suicide is do they feel they are a burden? They don't want to be putting other people under pressure, needing to care for them. They don't like the options for the continuing life. And so they suicide. And I think that the suicide then is, is not the, the answer. We need to find answers about how to make them feel differently about themselves and feel valuable so they don't want to choose death. How does he feel about being dependent on others? Maybe that's a big question. One that I haven't really discussed with him in detail. He's an independent person and um, Maybe his fear is being dependent on others, more so than other things. No, that's not a major factor with me at all. I wouldn't want to be a burden on other people, but, it's, but I'd feel that I'd be a burden on myself if I couldn't do the things I want to do for myself. I've always been fairly uh, independent and I want to remain that way. So what have you been doing lately, Poppy? At home? Yeah. Oh, well, we swim about every second day and then Monday we do exercises and... We go for a walk every morning, yeah. Nanny and I. Ed's son, Richard, has two teenage daughters. When it comes to the kids, you know, in a way, as a parent, I want to protect them. But they also need to, to know what's going on, so I'm not going to protect them all that much, you know. I will tell them what is happening. How do you think Richard explains to the grandchildren that the grandparents have actually taken their own lives? How, would, how do you go through that process? Well, I should imagine it'd be rather difficult for Richard. 
Get the best part of you, Matty, the back of your head. That'll be shit. Yes, thanks. Ed Brown has some equipment which he'll use to suffocate himself if he can't get something else. His son is torn. He doesn't want his father to suicide, yet he hates the thought of him dying alone. You said if you thought it would make a difference, you would camp outside your father's house. Oh, if I thought it would make a difference, yeah. I mean, I'd do, I'd do what had to be done. I don't think he'd go to those extremes, but if he did, it wouldn't make any difference. Um, I'd hope he'd come in and, uh, and be with me when it happened, but uh, I can hope for that. Ninety-one-year-old Bill Cooper has been rehearsing his suicide method. But he won't do anything while he's the primary carer for his wife, Joyce, who has Alzheimer's disease. Are you still planning to take your own life? Yes, it's on hold, unfortunately, while I'm a carer. You know, it's, uh, you feel responsible for another person and, uh, unfortunately, I can't shake that feeling of responsibility and I feel that uh, when my wife finally doesn't recognise me and I can't do anything for her, she might still have time to go, but I feel that's allow me to uh, go as well. Oh! Yeah. Did I get that for nothing? Yep. I think that if you can see what happens to people, when they lose dignity and they're relying on others, um, clearly he's, he's had a look at that and felt that that's not where he wants to be. If I'm not beautiful when I finish, God help me, love. Bill Cooper's greatest fear is that one day he will collapse and wake up in a nursing home. When you're old, you usually collapse in the chair. You're taken away to the hospital and, of course, from there on your history, you're under the influence uh, or the uh, dictatorship of the medical profession. They tell you what to do and they order you about, of course. You're in a stage where you can't do much about it. Perhaps we need to be thinking of the fact that uh, providing care is in fact a very dignified thing. Receiving care from our own humankind is indeed something that happens with dignity. And that whole process of, of coming to the end of life when you are needing care, perhaps is something that enriches our society. All right, there's the, the fold at the bottom. Then next, uh, I cut the tape. A few years ago, Bill Cooper started researching how to end his life. And hopefully he's read many books and he's been to an end-of-life workshop. Any questions? I'm not going to use this tomorrow. I might have to keep this as an insurance for the future. That might be some years down the track. The retired public servant has decided he will use a complicated mechanical method that will result in suffocation. You, you test everything to see that it is working and going well. And in my case, certainly, I would have rehearsed it many times. And no one can do this properly and effectively unless they made a detailed study of it. So they have the right procedures, the right techniques and the right equipment. My main fear is that uh, people uh, don't die that easily. They convulse. Well, I'm not going to be an expert in these matters. But the next, I'd be concerned mainly that I might make a jerky movement that might upset the apple cart. He's actually going to get this right when he does it. And in fact, if you don't get it right, my understanding is that, you know, he could leave himself in a more vulnerable or a worse position. But the fact that he has to actually practice this is a pretty sad indictment on society, I think. I think I'm the only sane person everybody else is <laughs> But still, that I don't want to be sitting around nursing homes month in and month out living a miserable life, I can't see any life in that at all. Most of the figures I know say that about 70% of people across the board think you should be allowed to kill yourself if you're faced with serious alternatives. And uh, most people realise that 
while nursing homes are good, they're not ideal. But there again, like so many other things in life, it's a matter of class differences. The more affluent you are, the better the grade of aged care you're going to get. Lorna Price, who lives in the exclusive Sydney suburb of Mossman, won't be using the same suicide method as Bill Cooper. Instead, she wants one day to have access to a pill. The pill is not available, which is why I'm prepared to speak up. I think it should be available, and I think there's a big need for it. People are living longer and longer. Our lives are being drawn out. There's a lot of money being spent on extending our lives and no money available at all to end them if we want to. After her husband died 25 years ago, Lorna Price became interested in learning how to end her own life when she could no longer care for herself. What she discovered was there were few peaceful ways that were legally available. I guess I've always planned and my husband was a planner. I just don't want to be able to not look after myself. Um, achieving things in my life, not big things like Nobel Prizes, but just weeding the garden, something like that. I think that's a tremendous contribution to happiness. And to just be inert and not do anything, not to cook your own dinner, not to choose what you're going to wear, not be able to wash yourself even, I think they're the main factors. And have I told you I'm going to uh, Spain? Yep. Some doctors raise depression as a factor in suicide. And they say depression often goes undetected and untreated in the elderly. Depression in the elderly is certainly something that we as clinicians, as doctors, as GPs, need to be very aware of and need to have the conversation with our patients about how they're feeling, how they're viewing their lives. Long-time experts on geriatrics, Professor Sol Ensel and Professor Tony Bro, disagree. Depression doesn't start with age and the, the evidence is not that older people are more depressed than other younger people. Uh, if, the, if older people are more depressed, it's for reasons apart from the fact that they're over 70 or over 80. I believe that as long as you're fit and healthy and not disabled, you get more contented and less depressed as you get older. Are you depressed? No, I don't think I'm depressed. Uh, I get fed up with things, not, but just I can't even think of what I, what I get fed up with. I'm sure I'd get fed up if I couldn't walk or couldn't look after myself but then I can't understand why anybody wouldn't. No, I don't think I'm depressed at all. Should you be talking to a psychiatrist before you decide to take <laughs> a No, I don't think so. One of the big advantages of the liquid form of this drug is that it is so effective. One of the At this exit workshop in Melbourne, Philip Nitschke takes elderly people step by step through the various suicide methods, not all of which are legal. Of all the ways to kill yourself, he recommends the prohibited drug, Nembutal. If you want the best, you've got to get Nembutal. There may be something yet to be developed which is better, but as of now, the best drug for a peaceful end-of-life choice is Nembutal. It can be injected or it can be simply drunk. I have never seen anyone drink a bottle of this drug and finish their whiskey. That's all you need, one bottle. Almost a decade ago, pentobarbitone was removed from sale for human use when a new and less dangerous class of drugs became available. Before that, Nembutel, the trade name for the drug, was only available on prescription. Now its use is restricted to veterinarians for euthanizing and sedating animals. Well, it's history. There's an advert out of the 1950s women's magazine. It's a Nembutel advert. That's Women's Weekly in the 1950s. You may not be able to read it, but it says, tops in taste, colour, appeal and miscibility. Nembutal elixir. If you're having trouble with that fractious two-year-old, a, a few teaspoonfuls of Nembutal elixir and all your problems are over. <laughs> That's how common that particular substance was back in the 1950s. 
made all over the world. They Philip are... Nitschke is holding up an empty bottle of Nembutel, which is virtually impossible to get in Australia. Just possessing the prohibited drug now carries a maximum penalty of two years in prison. But that's no deterrent to many elderly people who go to Tijuana, just over the US border in Mexico, to buy Nembutel from veterinarian pharmacies. These elderly drug smugglers are all breaking federal customs laws as well as state drug laws. We've got a lot of experience now. We had over 100 people last year go across to Mexico and come back with this drug successfully to Australia. We've had over 20 people this year go over. By we, I mean Exit has. I know so there's no difficulty. You have to do things carefully. You can't uh, walk across the border coming back into America and wave the drug around because they'll simply take it off you. It's a prohibited import into America and it's a prohibited import into Australia. It's a very straightforward process to move. Another 100 elderly people are expected to go to Mexico this year. The exit group run by Philip Nitschke supplies them with maps showing where the drug can be purchased, photographs of what the drug looks like and details about the cost and any changes in labelling. In Tijuana they know there's an Australian market for Nebutel. actually has a sign in the window now which says Australian veterinary supplies available here. <laughs> Philip Nitschke is basically putting these people in harm's way. <clears throat> All he's doing is arming these people with information and then stepping back and letting these people uh, commit a crime. Um, if these people were to actually uh, import and be caught importing these drugs, clearly there's a criminal act uh, that has actually occurred. I don't think giving people access to good information is dangerous. I mean, the flip side of that is to say that the only way, it's a better way is to make sure that no one knows anything. The safest thing to do is to make sure that keep, people are kept completely in the dark. And as I said earlier, the only consequence of that is that you end up having people kill themselves in dreadful ways. I think giving people information is not dangerous. What it is, is empowering. This woman in her 80s recently returned from Tijuana with her single dose of the drug. The elderly drug smuggler doesn't want to be identified. The poverty and the... the it is just awful. You really have to go through filthy streets and you find these little shops that are veterinarians. And, but you, they're not in a cluster. You've just got to wander around and you think, oh, there's one over there, and go in and try that. I didn't go with any idea of immediately using this stuff. I just wanted something in case because I'm, I, I enjoy life. I'm busy and I've got, I lead a very active life. And I, but I just wanted something in my cupboard, my little stash. And uh, it, it was no problem really getting it in Mexico. It was a culinary expert. Oh, I wouldn't say expert. But many elderly people don't want to take the long trip abroad. These people believe an alternative should be offered in Australia. There's no way for us to get the best drug, which is Nembutal. There's no legal way to get it. And that's why some people are going to Mexico to try and buy it. But I'm a bit of a do-it-yourselfer, and so I'd rather have a go at making my own. It starts oh, to that. pick up speed. Yes. Mm. So we don't mm. take it up too okay. well. This is the reconstitution time. process. Reconstitution, oh, okay. yeah. right. As an act of civil disobedience, 20 elderly people have been making Nimbutel in a backyard laboratory. They put $2,000 each into the project and all want just one single dose of the drug. The manufacturing of an illicit drug carries a maximum penalty of 15 years in prison. All this shows to me the desperation that we've created in individuals where they believe they need to break the law to, to have, in a way, a way of protest to choose end of life. We have to solve what the desperation is about. We have to relieve them of the need and belief that they should have and need to have the right to choose death over continuing to live. Should they be prosecuted? If people break the law, they are prosecuted. There's, that's what happens. So yes, indeed, if I break the law, I should be prosecuted. That, that's the law of the land and that's the way it goes.
The complex project started in October 2005 when the elderly people went to a secret location in the southern highlands of New South Wales where they set up an illegal backyard laboratory. And here we without sin cast the first piece of charcoal. Uh, <laughs> well done, Freddie. Four Corners was given this footage of exit members making the drug. Get 500 here. Smear a little Vaseline on Big and Little Willie. Lorna Price was there on the day. I've still always been very law-abiding and so has the whole family. But I've just decided I should stand up and be counted here. I'm not a rebel by nature at all, but I think I should be stand up and be counted because I do think we should have that possibility of ending our lives gently and peacefully. You don't mind breaking the law? I'm normally quite law abiding. I happen to believe that this law is wrong and I don't feel that I'm breaking any moral law. In my mind, I believe uh, Philip Nitschke is driving um, the demand for these illegal acts. I think he is um, passionately um, decided that these people do want it and he is going to provide the information at any cost. And is that morally responsible? I think it's morally irresponsible. Your opponents would say you're driving it. What would you say to that? Well, I mean, I, I, I people, I, I talk to our, people that come to our organisation all the time, and I mean, it wasn't exactly my idea. People came uh, to me and said, uh, this is what we want, like they knew that this was a drug they wanted, and so the question is, where can we get it from? And so we looked at it, we, I was part of the discussions. With sodium, we cannot have it come into contact with any water or it will explode. That weekend, the 20 elderly people took the first step to making Nembutel. They got their information from a wide range of sources. It was really the blind leading the blind because, uh, you know, what chemistry we learned at school was has long been forgotten. They had no chemistry background and were using potentially dangerous chemicals, including metallic sodium. University students are only allowed to handle the highly reactive chemical under strict supervision. The great hazard, of course, is if it comes into contact with water, so that was of great concern because on the weekend we were using a tent and I was watching the weather all the time because I thought if it rains and we're doing this in the tent and the water drips down off the, off the uh, roof of the tent onto the substance, well, well, we won't need to make a peaceful pill or go out with a big bang. But, of course, it didn't happen. It took them two years and many failures. It's crystals in there. It's been extremely frustrating and difficult times and uh, there have been moments when we've had doubts about whether we would uh, get a, an outcome to it. So the crystals that we actually made and dried... This year the group finally succeeded in their attempts to make the illegal drug. It's been an assay and uh, it's shown, been shown to contain pentobarbital. Um, which is the active ingredient in Nimitol. What, professionally assayed? Yes, oh yes. <laughs> what a uh, we need a guinea pig, don't we? <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> suggesting. <laughs> He's only promised me he'll live to 104. In accepting we've been involved in what could be described as an illegal activity, mm -hmm. and it's made uh, communication via telephones, and that's something of a no-no. Not just nice. that, though. It's uh, any research project can expect all these hiccups. That's right. I mean, no. Some members of the group recently got yeah, together. With this matter. drug, when would you take it? I wouldn't take it until I felt my quality of life was at an end. And S then if I could get my hands on a drug, I would be happy to take it. And has it concerned you that you've been breaking the law? Uh, it has. 
I don't normally go in for breaking the law. 96-year-old Fred Short is proud of his involvement in the backyard laboratory. I think there should be legal means for people to choose their own time and place of death and to die with dignity. And does it worry you that you could possibly go to jail for being involved in this project? No, it never has worried me. Mind you, at my time of life, I probably wouldn't be there for very long. <laughs> so, Brom, why did you get involved in this very controversial project? Because I believe in my right to decide the end of my life, the way I have a right to decide the way I live. And Are you sick? No, not at all. So I'm very healthy. What, so what could you possibly want with this drug at this stage? I'm, I don't need it at this stage, but I might need it in the future. So you might I'm, need it if you get old and frail and can't look after yourself, is that? Yes, yes, exactly. I do not want to be locked up in a nursing home where all you get is bingo or uh, sing songs. That's about <laughs> it. The liquid Nembutal has been crystallised and is about to be sent to 16 members of the group. Now, Dawn, your Nembutal might be arriving very soon. When are you going to take it? When I'm ready. When I'm told I can't look after myself. Does it mean, if you've got the drug handy, that you're likely to take it earlier than... Heavens no. And it can't be earlier at 82, can it? That's actually... Four Corners has been told there are about 800 elderly people waiting to get involved in making Nembutal in backyard laboratories across Australia. At least four separate projects are about to start in Perth, Sydney, Wollongong and Melbourne. And why such a big queue of people waiting? Well, uh, I, I think this, is, this, this, this comes about because of, of, of the substance, Nembutal. Uh, it, it's, it, it is, it's, it's the holy grail of self-deliverance. I don't doubt that there will be people who find their ways into the law courts before this issue is resolved. Uh, not just with this strategy, but other strategies. I mean, this is an ongoing strategy, this Peaceful Pill project. Does it concern you that authorities might see this as a sort of opening the floodgates and lots of illicit backyard laboratories starting up, it might provoke them into to taking action? Well, yes, it's, uh, I can't uh, speak for what the authorities will do, but it's, uh, may, it may well uh, lead, lead to some, some action and uh, uh, from what I can see, the people that I have spoken to in these groups that are forming are, all, are very much aware of that and they're prepared to go ahead. Ed Brown is one of those who wants to get involved no matter what the personal cost. I'll put my name forward for it and I hope I'll be chosen. But that's there, about a thousand people <laughs> wanting to get in on it, so uh, only the lucky ones will be chosen. And would you be prepared to go to jail for your, oh, yeah. for your beliefs? Oh, of course I would. Yeah, no, no point in doing it unless you're prepared for the consequences. It's that important to you? It is. What about people, the critics, who are going to say, look, you're, you're an elderly man who's misguided? What would you say to them? Well, I suppose we're all misguided to a certain extent, but uh, I hold my b beliefs uh, uh, ser seriously and conscientiously and uh, they're entitled to hold their beliefs seriously and conscientiously, but not to foist them on me. Is this a relatively new phenomenon, the elderly people wanting to opt out at a time of their own choosing? I don't think so. I think it's been around for a long time. Uh, it's become much more obvious because there are so much many more older people. This is an exit dinner dance and attending are some of society's most unlikely activists. Civil disobedience is traditionally practiced by the young. But this may be changing as the elderly population skyrockets. It seems this is a debate that's not going to go away.